All right, welcome back. Uh, we're going to continue on with some lead VBA uh, and malicious Excel 4 macros with Robert Simmons. Thank you. Hello. How is everybody? I'm uh, Rob Simmons, and uh, I go by Utkonos as my handle. And today we're going to be talking, this is actually in sort of a technical way, this is a bit of a historical talk because uh, recently Microsoft has uh, given everyone the, the opportunity to disable this type of macro. Uh, but what we're talking about today is not VBA macros. Uh, this is the slightly older one, which, was, uh, which basically uh, caused a panic uh, in 2020 and 2021 and then early 2022 where uh, many threat actors were using Excel 4.0 or XLM macros uh, in their uh, you know, Excel documents, malicious Excel documents. So I was thinking when this first began, I did a bunch of research on this uh, mid-2020 and I was thinking why, why did it take so long for threat actors to uh, I would say rediscover uh, Excel 4.0 macros. And then I looked at the timeline and kind of reviewed like the, the um, release dates of Excel back in the 90s. And so Excel 4.0, which is where Excel macros were, Excel 4.0 macros were introduced. This is 1992. And then in 1993, uh, Microsoft released Excel 5.0. And Excel 5.0 is where they uh, introduced Visual Basic for applications, so VBA macros, the type of macros that we're very familiar with uh, up until 2020 in, you know, from the threat landscape. And so I, I realized that it's probably because uh, these, were only, these were only used actively by businesses for about a year, and so knowledge about them basically uh, you know, was only visible for maybe a year before a better technology for creating macros was adopted the year, one year later. And so I think it was basically just forgotten, and you know, people didn't really notice it until 2020 when a few of the early adopters uh, began using it. So that some of the earliest adopters of the Excel 4.0 macros in their uh, Lure documents were Zloader and Drydex. Um, and I, some people I, hear, I, I think here are familiar with them. Um, but then, you know, later on, within a few months, uh, almost every threat actor you can think of is, is uh, just pumping out uh, Excel documents with Excel 4. Point, with malicious Excel 4.0 uh, macros. So uh, I had a I had a customer who was uh, very interested in blocking uh, Excel 4.0 macros, and at the time there was quite a lot of research going into. Uh, reverse engineering um, Excel 4.0 macros to see what the macro is doing and how it operates and things like this. But I took a step back because the, uh, the company uh, that I was doing this work for, they, they do uh, email, uh, you know, email blocking for, for malicious files and attachments and that sort of thing. So I was thinking there's no uh, business reason for real companies to have Excel 4.0 macros in a document in the first place. There's no, uh, you know, the, the technology only existed by itself alone for that one year in the 90s. And so, you know, the number of companies that are actually actively using this in something that they would want to have in an email attachment is uh, zero. So uh, what I did was I took a step back and I looked at the methods for detecting the presence of macros. Instead of figuring out what the macro is doing or how it's doing it or you know, uh, basically decoding it or anything like that, I wanted to find out the fastest way to determine if a document has Excel 4.0 macros so that it can just be blocked and discarded or sent to a sandbox or whatever it is that, the, that you would do with that particular uh, email. And so I found three detection opportunities for uh, Excel 4.0 macros. Uh, the first one is called the BOF record, the beginning of file, uh, B-O-F record. The second detection opportunity is in the bound sheet record 
And the third detection opportunity is in a stream in a compound file called the document summary information. And so all of these three locations in an Excel document, uh, and we're talking about compound files, we're not talking about the later uh, XLSX, the uh, XML uh, uh, zip format of, uh, of Excel files. We're just talking about compound. And so these three detection opportunities are uh, in any, uh, not all three of them will exist, but if you have Excel 4.0 macros in a document, it will have one of these three, or all of them. So what we're first going to look at is the BOF record, the beginning of file. And so the BOF record, to understand the BOF record, we need to do a little bit of, uh, uh, have a little bit of a history lesson. So the BOF record is part of the binary interchange file format, or BIF, the BIF format. And BIF, uh, long ago, actually right in Excel 4.0 and earlier, uh, Excel 2, Excel 3, and Excel 4 versions, uh, the binary interchange file format was the Excel file format. So the BOF record, if you, uh, if you uh, know what a magic number is, which is the first couple of bytes in a file which indicates what file type it is, often. There's some, some file types that don't have a magic number, but most file types have a magic number of some kind. And so the BOF record, the first bytes of the BOF record are actually the magic number from the older BIF format of the old uh, Excel files. So I'm going to show you visually what this means. Um, so in Excel 4.0 and earlier, which is the one on the left, that's the whole document. That's the file. And up in the upper left-hand corner, that is a BIF4 four, BIF four or Excel 4.0 uh, magic number. So that was, like, if you, op if you take a hex editor and you open an old Excel 4.0 file, it actually doesn't have any of the compound file uh, streams and the fat and all that stuff. It's just this. It's an Excel 4.0 uh, BIF4 uh, encoded file. Now, Excel 5.0, that was where the compound file, uh, CFB, compound file binary, was introduced. And so what Microsoft did, and, and uh, if you're familiar with compound files, it's OK if you're not. They basically uh, a collection of a number of file allocation tables. So it's very similar to the format that's used on disk, but it's actually within a file. And so there are sectors, and it can actually become fragmented. Um, there are, there's the mini fat, there's the fat, and then there's the fat for the directory, the directory fat. Um, but the compound, the compound file in this case basically to create the Excel 5.0 and newer, they just took the BIF of the old version of Excel and turned that into one of the streams inside of the compound file. And so this is kind of my artist rendition of, of that concept. And also this up here, this uh, DOC doc file, that's actually, that's the compound file magic number. You'll, if you do malware analysis and look in hex editors a lot, that's one of the ones that just uh, becomes rote. So this is Excel 2.0. Uh, down there at the bottom, this is where all of these files, so if you want to go play around with any of these, uh, there's a collection of reference files um, maintained by OpenOffice. And so OpenOffice has every, every single version of uh, Office file, Excel, Word, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the different versions in this big table on this page. And so you can download uh, test documents, um, which were very nice for all, all the research that I was doing. But this is the uh, Excel 2.0, and you can see the progression. So this is Excel 3.0. They've made a few changes just to uh, indicate the version in the magic number. Uh, and then 4.0. And then the transition from 4 to 5, you can see here, this is a very big difference. So you go from, uh, this is the, so BIF is the Excel 4.0, or the Excel file itself. And now you see in, in BIF 5, the Excel 5.0 uh, BIF 
document is actually just a stream inside of the compound file. So I hope that's clear. Uh, if you want to de if you wanted to dive into any of the details of this specification, uh, the official Microsoft documentation is here. I'll provide slides after this. I also wrote a blog post that's available. Um, but the specification is here, the official spec is here, and then another really great resource um, because they have a, a, a mission of uh, preserving documents and stuff like that. So the United States Library of Congress has a very in-depth uh, page about how uh, the this digital format and different uh, you know different uh, uh, features of the of the BIF and uh, Excel format. So there are three three very good tools. Uh, uh, one of them still maintained, two of them fairly old, for viewing BIF. Now, uh, who is, who here has heard of OffViz? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, so OffViz is pretty awesome, by the way. Um, if you are familiar with any of the text editors which have a uh, templating system, which will highlight, it'll, uh, you, it's not just a normal text editor, but it's a text editor that will parse and highlight different uh, components in the binary and show you what they are. One of those text editors is called 010 editor. Some, some of you are probably familiar with 010. I see some nodding heads. Another one that's really, uh, I think is actually better than 010 is called Signalize It Pro. Um, it's a Mac only, uh, but it does, it does the same sort of thing. What OffViz does, so I had gone on a quest to find something that works like 010 or, uh, or Signalize it, which could show me, you know, basically parse and show me all of the, the meaning of all the components in a compound file, and that thing doesn't exist. Well, that thing doesn't exist in templates for those two hex editors. But I found this old program, it's uh, called OffViz. It's officially, it's a Microsoft, piece of Microsoft software, and it basically has a hex editor, and then it has uh, the, you know, basically the, the parsing and the meaning of all of the different bytes. So you, you can select a byte uh, or a set of bytes in the hex editor, and it will show you what those are, like what the, what, um, you know, what that structure means. We're going to see some uh, screenshots of OffViz, and it's really awesome. The official uh, download, it still exists in Microsoft. You can still download it. Uh, it only runs on my, uh, Windows 7. I haven't gotten it uh, to run on anything else. There's a newer version uh, on this person's GitHub, but uh, as, as always, I would say, you know, uh, your mileage may vary. I've not looked at whether this is, this is an unofficial one. You know, you're getting it from an unofficial source, so I, uh, you know, I say, you know, do whatever you want, but you know, be careful with the one from GitHub. But the one that's official is a little older version. I haven't figured out how to download the uh, newer version from somewhere official at Microsoft, but who cares? Uh, Biff View plus plus. This is another Biff viewer. It's real. This is another piece of weird software because it uh, parses the it parses the uh, Biff structures and then produces HTML, and then it opens, uh, it, it opens um, uh, uh, Explorer. So you have to use uh, Microsoft Explorer to, to with this thing. This is really old stuff. This is really like uh, uh, really wild, fun stuff. Uh, and then Ole Dump, so Didier Stevens has uh, Ole Dump, and this has the capability of viewing these different uh, BOF and BIF records uh, if you need to. So. This is what OffViz looks like. So if you've seen, you know, you, know you, you can kind of recognize that this is a bit like 010 editor, but you know, it's specific for this type of file. Uh, you have the, the hex editor on one side, and then the meaning of those different structures on the, on the other side. And you can see here, it shows you, uh, you know, you, you basically give it a particular uh, BIF version, so you could tell it, I want to parse BIF 5, or I want to bar parse BIF 8, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. And then it shows you what, uh, what it parses out of the file that you give it. So you can see here it, it found a BOF record, a beginning of file. 
This is the exact same file. And by the way, if you want to follow along later on your own, the file that I'm using is at this uh, URL down at the bottom. So this is one of the sample files from uh, the OpenOffice repository. And so here you can see this is a, you know, this is a screenshot from uh, Explorer. And so you can see this has parsed out the BOF record and the, fir you know, the, the first few bytes are 809 and then 16, this is the length of the BOF record. We're gonna see in a moment, there's two, uh, two, two valid BOF, le BOF record lengths, eight bytes and 16 bytes. Uh, what we're looking at here is a 16-byte BOF record, so that means it's BIF-8. You know, I know we're, I, you know, we're cheating because it says BIF-8 down there, but BIF-8 is the only uh, specification that has a 16-byte BOF record. This is the same, that same exact file, but this is showing the results of uh, the BIF plugin in OlliDump. And so you can see it pulls out that exact same uh, information. Now, these are all, this is not all the BIF versions, but these are the, the main, main BIF versions. This is uh, extracted directly from the, uh, also from the OpenOffice uh, repository. So we're gonna cover a lot of these. Um, you know, obviously some of these don't have Excel 4.0 macros in them that are earlier than 4.0, so we're just gonna kind of ignore those. But today we're going to focus on BIF 4, BIF 5, uh, BIF 7, and BIF 8. BIF 7 is actually not listed here, but uh, sorry, BIF 5 and BIF 8. Now, the BOF record looks like this. So the 0908 at the beginning, so that's actually, it's Little Endian, and so this is actually 809. You'll see, if we look back here, it's 809 over there by BOF. That's like the, that's the BOF magic number. If you remember, th this used to be the beginning of a file, or you I mean it's called BOF, but it used to be the beginning of the whole file. It's not just a stream in the compound file. So, but, and so 0908, this like is the ancient, you know, this is kind of like finding a fossilized, uh, uh, magic number inside of another file. So this is like the fossilized um, Excel magic number from the ancient times, last century. <laughs> um, the next two bytes, so you see this is um, uh, 10, zero, zero, so this is 16 bytes. So this is showing the length, the overall length of the beginning of file record uh, version, and so six, this indicates that it is a BOF 8, a BIF, sorry, BOF, uh, BOF version 6 in BIF 8, <laughs> BOFs and BIFs. Um, and then these last four bytes, the four, uh, the 40 here, this indicates that this BOF record uh, is for a file that contains Excel macros, so XLM macros. So this is a chart of the different lengths. And so BIF 5 and BIF 7 both have eight bytes, uh, can only be eight bytes. And so you're going to see uh, an eight there. BIF 8 can be eight or 16. So both of these are valid. And so you'll see eight or 10. Then the version, so BIF 5 and BIF 7 both have a version of, uh, of five, you know, 500, 500 in hex. Uh, BIF 8 is 600 in hex. So you, you can see the direction we're going here. What we're going to do is, is build a YAR rule, uh, which can detect this information in a file. So when, when you need to build a YAR rule, like if you have something that, like this, right, um, this is pretty good, but you want to have something that, that cuts down even more because the, there are, there's a concept in YAR called atoms, and so you want to have uh, larger atoms rather than smaller atoms because a small, the smaller the atom or the smaller the chunk of bytes that you're searching for, the higher probability of that uh, occurring in many different places in a file and some of them being false positive stuff that you're not looking for. So you wanna, you wanna have a longer string rather than a shorter string and have it specific to what you're looking for. So if you look here in 
uh, off viz, we can see that the last two bytes of uh, this BOF record are reserved, and so they should be zero at all times. And so that means this is the YAR hexade uh, hexadecimal string for a BOF record. So you've got the 0908, and then the size, which is 16 bytes, uh, and then you've got the version 600, and then you have 40 for Excel macros. Um, you have a bunch of other stuff, which is like uh, you know another other information that can be uh, found in the BOF record, but is highly variable. So it's stuff that you want to put a jump. So you have 10 bytes of jump, and then two uh, reserved bytes at the end. And so this is your um, hex string that you're going to use in the the uh, Yara rule. So this is just a simple one to look for the beginning of file record in BIF 5 and 7. And so you can see it has an 8 byte. So you've got the 0908, and then you have 8 bytes, which is the length of the BOF record. And then you have the version 5, and then uh, Excel 4.0 macros. This one is BIF 8 with Excel 4.0 macros and length 8. So, you know, figure that out. Uh, and then this one is the longer one. This is the newest one, so BIF 8. 16 byte length, uh, version six, has Excel 4.0 macros, and then that little trailing bit with the, with the reserved bytes. So these three rules will detect uh, a BOF record in a uh, compound file. They're nice and small, and so they're not going to actually, they, they won't span, uh, they're not going to span a fragment, because, well, they're, they're never going to span a fragment, I should say, because this is the BOF, so this is always going to be at the beginning of a sector in the compound files file allocation table. And so you're never going to have a problem with this spanning two, uh, two sectors. So if you, if you have, like we're gonna see later when we get into other uh, indicators, they can actually span two uh, sectors and become fragmented and then you'll have a false negative because the file will actually have that record that you're looking for, but it will be broken up so it can't be observed by Yara. So the second, uh, the second opportunity for detection is called the bound sheet record. So bound sheet record, again, is another, it's a different BIF component. And the content of a bound sheet record, so there's one bound sheet record for each sheet. So if you're familiar with Excel, uh, you've got the little tabs down at the bottom, which you can change the sheet. So you have sheet one, sheet two, you can change the name of those to something uh, arbitrary, but they begin as sheet one, sheet two, sheet three. So each one of those sheets uh, has a bound sheet record. And so the bound sheet record, the content in the bound sheet record has the name of the sheet. So you know it begins with sheet one, sheet two, sheet three. If you change it, uh, if you're using an older version of Excel, if you change it, it can only be ASCII characters. In newer versions of Excel, the name is stored as Unicode, and so it has uh, Unicode characters. Now, the, other, the last bit of information that's in the, the bound sheet record is the position in the stream, so uh, where that bound sheet is actually located within the stream. So it's basically uh, the address, it's like the address of the offset. So, the way Excel works is if you open something and then you make a change, uh, it might save that sheet somewhere else in the file allocation table as, you know, as its algorithms choose what sectors to, 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 uh, to save it to. So it would then save the offset of where it saved the bound sheet itself, like the data for the bound sheet, and it would save that position in the stream in the bound sheet record, which we're looking at here. The name, of the, the name of the sheet can be stored in ASCII or in Unicode. ASCII for older, so BIF 7 and earlier is going to be ASCII. BIF 8 is Unicode. And the sheet, the, the sheet name has right before it is a number, which is the length. And the length for BIF 7 is the measurement in bytes, so how many bytes uh, the, the name is. And that, you know, it actually corresponds to, you know, the number of bytes uh, in ASCII is also the number of characters, but in Unicode, because you have uh, multiple bytes per character, 
it actually measures it in uh, the number of characters. So that's a, it's a difference that you, you have to remember when you're looking at these uh, uh, records. Now, this is in off-viz, so you can see here, this is a bound sheet, um, and you can, the, you know, this is detected as a subset of the BIF record. And this is what it looks like, so you have 85H, uh, and then 14 is the length, so this, uh, this bound sheet is 14 bytes long. And then you can see over there, those last few bytes, 53, 68, 65, 65, 74, 31, that's sheet one with a capital S. If you, if, who, who here can translate directly in their head from uh, hex to ASCII? I, I can't, but I, I cheat, I know. Um, and then this is the same thing, again, using OlliDump and the, the plug-in BIF. So we're gonna do a little bit of bound sheet math. Um, I hope everyone is prepared for a little bit of math. This one is probably not gonna be crazy math. We're gonna get a little bit, we're gonna keep stepping up the math a little bit uh, later, but this is the bound sheet record. This is the magic number. So uh, in the bound sheet, just like everything, there's like a magic number at the beginning that signifies the start of that particular record type. This is the length, so 0E is 14 bytes. Uh, this is sheet one down here. And then this is saying that the, sh that the, the name sheet one is six characters long. And then this is just, it, this, so this here is eight bytes, and this is an important, uh, an important number to keep in mind when we're going to build a, um, a YAR rule, because the, this is the minimum uh, bound sheet uh, length. Because if you have a nameless sheet, so if you remove all of the characters from that particular tab and save it, you're going to have nothing, this, this is going to be nothing, these are gonna be gone, and then these are all going to be zeros, and then this, the other thing, those other numbers are, are, are not important for us right now, I will we'll explain them in the moment, but this is like the minimum bound sheet record size of eight bytes. So, uh, then you have the maximum bound sheet record, and you have to kind of calculate this. There's, it's not in the documentation anywhere. You just have to use it uh, as logic. But the maximum number of characters in UTF, so UTF is going to be the one that absorbs the most number of bytes, so the ASCII will be shorter. So you want to, if you're looking for maximum, the maximum number is going to be in um, UTF-8. And so the maximum number of characters that you can put in the sheet name is 31. And so 31 plus those housekeeping bytes that we saw and then the length, uh, that equals 136 bytes, so 88, x88. So what we wanna do is, find, this, this is the beginning of, uh, of a YAR rule, so what we're doing is we're, we're pulling in an unsigned 8-bit eight, eight, eight unsigned integer at position uh, bound sheet, so the position of the bound sheet record that we're uh, looking at, and then the second byte with uh, starting counting from zero. So the zeroth byte is the first one, you know, zero, one, two. And so we're taking the unsigned 8-bit integer uh, at position two. And so now we've got a maximum and a minimum boundary. So we've got uh, the, the, the data that we're looking at needs to be above eight, above or equal to eight, and below or equal to uh, 88 in hex. Now, that's, that's one, you know, one boundary that we're, that we're using, that we will use in, uh, in the YAR rule. Now, this right here, this byte here, this is the state of the, of the sheet. Uh, and there's three possible states. There's uh, visible, hidden, and very hidden. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I don't. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. Your your guess is as good as mine. What their thinking was there, but there are three states: hidden, very hidden, and visible. So visible is zero. So if the state, if this byte is zero. 
it's uh, visible. So these are the three states. You have visible, zero, hidden is one, and then very hidden is two. Now, if you'll notice, this byte, this position, uh, doesn't have anything else in these other bits. So these other bits are reserved, and they're all supposed to be zero. What I found by looking through uh, an absurd number of uh, malicious Excel files is that in these reserved bits, there are certain malware actors that put data in those bits. And I gotta tell you, like if you're out there writing malware, um, doing something unique like this is awesome. Please continue doing that because it allows me to associate different files that you didn't think I was able to associate because you're doing the same weird shit in two different files. So these, uh, these, these bits should never have ones, but you know, there's a, a, a quite, a, quite a group of different malware actors that for some reason, whatever binder they're using or whatever thing they're doing, uh, puts data in these uh, reserved bits. And so it's a nice indicator. If you see data in these bits, that file is malicious, 100%. 100% confidence. So what you need to do, because those bit, you can't just compare that, that byte. You can't just say, take this byte and compare it to zero, one, or two, because if you put data in those other bytes, it's going to change that number, right? You're gonna change that number to a number that's not zero, one, or two, because of the, you know, uh, bitwise arithmetic. So what you need to do is use a bitwise and, so you take the data from that byte that we just talked about and we found from position eight, and then you do a bitwise and against the mask of three. And so if the, if the, if the bitwise and against the mask of three equals zero, then this, uh, this indicates that it is uh, visible. If the result of that calculation uh, comes and you know equals one, then that means it's hidden. And then if it equals two, it's very hidden. So that's a way to detect whether the detect the state even in those malicious uh, Excel documents. Now, this one, this this test is going to show you. So if this test is true, this is a malicious document. So if, that, if the data in that particular uh, uh, byte is greater than two, it's automatically malicious. Like there's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It is malicious. Uh, okay, so the next, the next position in here is this one. And the uh, a one, uh, just the number one in this particular byte indicates that this bound sheet contains Excel 4.0 macros. So this little bugger right here is the thing that you want to uh, determine and then exclude uh, if you see it. So this is a bound sheet record. Um, by the way, I have actually removed the information. So if you look, there's a five byte jump. So we've got the bound sheet uh, magic number, 85. And then we have a length here, and so the length can be many different lengths. So I've got uh, a wild card for the length. The second byte of the length is always zero uh, because the, the, ma that the, the maximum length that we calculated a bit ago, which is 136, I think, is uh, 88 uh, bytes, 88. Uh, that's the maximum. So the second byte of that number is always zero. So you can go ahead and put a zero in your YAR rule. And then because having uh, 85, zero, zero, uh, and then a wild card, and then zero, and then a five byte jump, and then a, uh, a one. So that is the, um, that's the, the thing that we're gonna be looking for. The reason I put the visibility byte in the jump is because of those malicious folks that put garbage data in those bytes, because that, that byte, even though it should only be zero, one, or two, uh, it actually can just be anything. So I went ahead and threw it in the jump. So this is your, uh, this is a uh, nice and fun uh, YAR rule. So what I'm doing here is 
First of all, I'm making a loop, and this is looping through all of the instances of a bound sheet. So maybe you're going to find uh, you know, five or six, you know, some, some malware authors will put multiple uh, sheets in one particular malicious file. So you need to assert loop through all of them. So this is going to find each one of those instances of a bound sheet. So you're going from one to the number of bound sheets that it finds. And then this is how you indicate that in, uh, in Yara, Yara East. Then this, what I'm doing here is looping through J. So I'm comparing this uh, to 0, 1, and 2. That way I catch uh, all visibility settings. And then finally, I've got the boundaries of the lower bound and the upper bound for the length of the, the, bound, the, the sheet name. Uh, this, is another, this is another one. So this, is, uh, so this one has the, sorry. This one is one that has, uh, that, that uh, doesn't have those, sorry, ha can have any reserve bits set. And this one uh, guarantees. So if this matches, you're guaranteed that those reserve bits are set. And so if this matches, you're definitely malicious. Now, by the way, I want to talk for a second about the, the, the brittleness of a YAR rule. So the more complexity that you add to a YAR rule, the more likely it is to uh, you know, not match, right? And so the utility of these YAR rules are more for uh, identifying something, but if, you've got, if, you, if you have uh, a massive number of files and you just want to uh, have a, cast a wider net, let's say, all you really need is the string uh, you don't actually have to do any of this other stuff. This other stuff is just kind of uh, to remove a few false positives. But if you want to, uh, if you want to have a looser, a looser rule, a less brittle rule, then just have the the the, the string by itself. So this is the third opportunity for detection, and it's in the document summary information. Um, I kind of amusing. You can see when I was last working on slides, because uh, you can see the time, time stamp on there. So I wanted to show you, uh, this, is, this is just a slide I made last night, because I wanted to show you uh, where, uh, as a point of reference, where in Excel uh, is the data coming from that's in a document summary information stream in a compound file. So this is where it all comes from, when you, you know, fiddle with all this stuff. And again, I love it when uh, adversaries put like some sort of information in here, especially you know uh, North Korean adversaries are you know they they love just putting their calling card in here, and then you can correlate different documents with different uh, different uh, North Korean adversaries. But this is a very rich uh, area in a compound file. Now this part, content, this is where we get into the part that has the Excel 4.0 macros information. Um, now this is what it looks like when you've got uh, five worksheets. So I, you know, I didn't do anything other than you know, add a worksheet, add a worksheet, add a worksheet, and then go look at the, the, um, the document summary information in the content. And so if you take, and I saved this and then ran it through EXIF tool, sorry this is a little bit out of, out of focus, but what you get is called heading pairs. And so it shows you that there are five heading pairs that it is parsed out of the document summary information. Now, if you have Excel 4.0, and this is in Russian, this is a Russian, local, Russian language uh, localized, localization. Uh, if you have Excel 4.0 macros, you run it through EXIF tool, and if, or if you just open it in a, in a uh, hex editor, you can see it. It's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not encoded, it's actually just in letters. Um, well, sorry, Russian would be encoded, but if it's in English and other lang certain other languages, uh, it wouldn't be encoded. But uh, you'll see up here is worksheets, so it's the same, same thing, you know, worksheets, listy. And then uh, you would have one Excel 4.0 macro sheet, so macrosi uh, Excel 4.0. So 
now we're going to, to do, get into just a taste of linguistics, little tiny taste of linguistics. So if you're familiar with uh, certain languages have what's called post-positive adjectives, and some languages have pre-positive adjectives. So a pre-positive adjective is an adjective that exists before, that's written or said before the noun that it modifies, so that's a pre-positive adjective, and some languages have a post-positive adjective which uh, follows the noun that it, that it modifies. Uh, I speak Russian, so I know that there's actually no word order in Russian, I know that, but there are conventions that are used in certain languages, especially for borrowed words. So Excel 4.0 is the adjective, and Excel 4.0 is modifying the noun macros. And so uh, in Russian, with the, the localization in Russian, the, uh, the adjective is a post-positive adjective and it follows the noun macros, macrosi. And so what you get is a uh, space character between the word macros and Excel 4.0 and then you have a, a null byte which indicates the end of the string at, uh, at this end. Now, uh, pre-positive adjectives, so that would be English, uh, so you've got Excel 4.0 is the adjective, and then the noun is macros, and so you see you've got the, uh, the, the preceding null byte, which begins the, the, the uh, string, and then the 20, is the, the space, is to the right after the Excel 4.0. So then you have some weird ones. So I, and, and again, like I went through all the languages and all the different um, localizations that I could possibly find examples of and then created files myself and looked at uh, all the different permutations. And so there was one, uh, one language which was kind of out there on its own, which is Norwegian. And so uh, for some reason in Norwegian, instead of having a space, they use a dash. Uh, a hyphen, so there's a 2D in here between the adjective, sorry, between the adjective and the noun. So uh, there's one false positive that I found, and so these are in uh, MSI's and installer patches, and it makes sense because the installer patch for Excel contains the string, you know, Excel 4.0 macros, but this doesn't indicate that it's a, uh, an Excel document, it's just the actual installer itself. So, uh, this is a false positive, which you have to use as a filter to exclude uh, from, uh, from, your, from your data set. Uh, there's an alternative way to filter false positives, which will catch this one naturally. Uh, and it is to add the property set header. So every single entry in a document summary information stream in a compound file is a property set, and each one of those property sets has a magic number, and then it has a record length. And so if you include, if you include the magic number and the record length in your YAR rule, along with the string that you're looking for together, you're going to automatically exclude MSIs and installer patches because that string doesn't, this, this particular string doesn't occur with the uh, property set headers. So you get this, this is what you end up with. Um, and this is, uh, use, this is using just the strings without the property set headers. So I've got the three permutations of uh, Excel 4.0 macros, and then this is the false positive. So any of those three that are the uh, correct and then not false positive. Now this is the three, so we, don't, we can get rid of that false positive, and we can use these three permutations which include the, uh, the header. So, this is the one, so this particular one, document summary information, that property set can occur anywhere in the document summary information depending on what uh, was saved before it and what was saved after it. And so because it's not uh, early in that sector, or early in that record, uh, it can span two sectors. And so this particular type of YAR rule 
is going to have some, uh, you know, not often, I had to, you know, I had to, I had to find one, but eventually I found one uh, where that particular, uh, and I think this is Chinese, that's why, that's why you don't actually see letters up there, but this is uh, Excel 4.0, well you can see down here Excel 4.0, but uh, the word macros is actually split across two uh, different sectors, so at a boundary of two sectors, and so my uh, rule is not going to not going to detect this one properly. So it's just something to keep in mind. This is a uh, a problem. Now, backing up a little bit, uh, you know, all of these files that we're looking at, because the magic number is for a compound file, I have the problem of this. You know, have if I use a YAR rule to look at the magic number of the file. I'm going to also find Word files and PowerPoint files and MSI files and, you know, uh, I think there's even like uh, some engineering uh, software that, you, that creates, uh, you know, compound and Hangul word processor, all these different types. So I want to know what is an Excel document? How do I know what an Excel document is? So. I took a step back and I thought, uh, how can I identify an Excel document? So there's three ways that you can identify a, an Excel document. Uh, the way that's really strong is looking at MIME type. So this is coming back from, um, from uh, the MAGIC uh, plugin for uh, the Ma MAGIC module in, uh, in Yara, or using EXIF tool or whatever tool you want to use to find the MIME type. That's a very strong method of, of determining it. You can also look at what's called the root storage object class ID, which we're gonna talk about in a moment. And you can also look at the stream names. So in the uh, root directory, you have the names of the streams, and if the compound file has a stream name of workbook or a stream name of book, these both indicate that the file is Excel. So MIME type, this is like the easy one, uh, you know, duh. My, magic, MIME type, application, VND, MS Excel, that's an Excel file, okay? Um, so that's the, that's the easy one. The problem is that this particular uh, module in, um, in, in Yara is rather slow, so it's not a good module to use if you're throwing like a large, large numbers of files at, at Yara and you want things to be efficient. You want to use, uh, you know, YAR rules that don't use a module. So we're going to look at the root storage uh, object class ID. So this is not a documented feature. It's something that you have to kind of either figure out on your own. Um, there's no documentation for it. However, uh, there are a few places that I found on the internet where they record known uh, class IDs and associate those with the software that created that particular file. And the first one is archiveteam.org. The second one is Ollie Tools, which I think you're familiar with. So both of these are collections of known class IDs that are, uh, you know, this is high quality data. So the root storage object class ID uh, is seen here. So the root entry, and you'll see CLS ID, and this is what it looks like. It's a UUID, okay? Uh, and so this is the UUID for, uh, this is actually the file that I created last night, and I opened it in, um, in Cerbero Profiler. And so this is the class ID. Uh, this is the hex representation of a UUID. So there's two ways, there's two data points that you need to find in the compound files header to find the location of the root entry, so the offset of the root entry. First number is the sector shift, and the second number is the uh, sector number of the first directory sector. So using these two numbers, you can calculate where the offset of the root directory begins, and then from there you can find all the information that we're going to be looking at in a moment. So this is a visual representation of those two. So the sector shift is pretty close to the beginning of the file. Then, you know, shortly after that, you've got the, the directory first sector. 
Uh, this is the calculation that you need to use is the equation. So the offset is uh, 2 to the power of s, which is the sector shift, plus n, which is the number of the first directory sector, times 2 to the power of s again. Um, now, this, co this has a, a, a little bit of a, a, an interesting twist because there's no exponent operator in Yara. You don't have a way to do exponent, so there's no like caret operator. Well, I mean, there's, there isn't an exponent operator. And so what you have to do is do a bitwise left shift to calculate the, uh, the exponent. So you take one bitwise left shift to S, okay? Told you we're getting into some a little bit more complex math. Um, and so what you do is you, re you want to reduce the terms of the equation. So if we go back here and look, uh, offset 30 is the sector shift, offset 48 is the uh, directory first sector. And so what we're doing here is we're taking those two values. So this is the sector shift and that one is the uh, directory first sector. And then I've just, you know, I've uh, uh, reduced the terms uh, from that previous equation. Now, what we want to do is find the class ID. And so the class ID is not at the beginning of the root, uh, uh, root entry. It's actually eight, 80 bytes into the root entry. And so this is the location of the uh, root and then 80 bytes in is the class ID. So that you end up with this, and so this is, this is kind of a universal, by the way, the bottom part of this is basically a universal uh, finder for class ID. So you can use this for any type of file to figure out what the class ID is. And so this class ID is Excel BIF5 class ID. This is the BIF8 class ID. Um, and I found by looking at a bajillion files that uh, there are two uh, categories of non-standard incorrect class IDs. So that's why this particular test is not 100% uh, great for n knowing that something is Excel because I've seen zeroed class IDs and I've also seen stomp class IDs. So there's a Maurer family called Abracadabra which just puts random numbers in the class ID. And so, uh, at the same time, uh, if you see all zeros or if you see, you know, uh, a, a non-standard class ID, those are going to be malicious. Now, the last, uh, the last indication of something being an Excel file, the workbook, or the book stream names. So these are fun. So Excel 5, the older version, used book. Excel 8 and newer uses workbook. And you can see here, uh, again, in Cerbero Profiler, if we're looking at the workbook, you can see that it begins with a BOF, the BOF record, which is what we were talking about a little bit ago. Now, the directory entry is a single directory entry, is 128 bytes long, and then a full directory in a compound file has 31 possible entries plus the root entry, so 32 entries. So, if we think about that, what we can do is create a YAR rule that looks through each entry in the directory and compares it to book or compares it to workbook. So what we're doing here is we're looking at dir name. So we're looking for all the occurrences of dir name. So there might be you know, six different directory names in this particular compound file. And then we're looking at each one at 100. So we're basically looking at a dir name zero. So if j is zero, uh, we've skipped over the, the root entry. But uh, we're adding one, which is the first one, and then times 128. And so you're, look, so you're looking at the length of each one. So you're basically uh, looking at the first one, and then the second one, third one, fourth one, et cetera. Uh, with that. And then this is the same sort of thing but comparing to the word workbook, the string workbook. 
And then, uh, this is, I'm wrapping up, but there are a couple of Yara glue rules that I call them, and these are ones that you've seen in earlier rules, like where you see compound file, and in some of the earlier uh, words it would say uh, Excel compound file. So those, are ac those actually refer to these glue rules that I wrote. So you have compound file, which looks for the compound file magic number, uh, and then this is, a, this is a combination of, and the Excel MIME is the one that we saw when we were looking at earlier. Uh, and then these are all the different possibilities for something to be a Excel compound file. So if it matches the root CLS ID for Excel 5, if it matches the root CLS ID for Excel 8, and then if it matches the uh, dir entry name for BIF 5, BIF 8, uh, either book or, or workbook or if it just uh, matches the MIME. And so these are all the different uh, possibilities of matching an Excel compound file. So this is the uh, blog post that I wrote uh, uh, for Reversing Labs blog. You can go check that out. Um, and it has m almost all the same information here. I've, I've put in a couple, a couple different screenshots in here. And any questions? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so um, I understand each of these individually. Uh, how can you be certain, since uh, each of these ways to figure out if it's a malicious file can be like a uh, workaround, how, how can you know that them combined cannot be uh, oh, workaround? Oh, so, so that's a good question. How do, you, how do I know, so uh, let me try to rephrase it. So how do I know that these can't be circumvented? Okay. So the third one, so uh, I could actually say that in, I presented them in uh, increasing probability of circumvention. So the third one, which is in the document summary information, uh, because it can be split across, uh, f you know, be uh, fragmented in the, the file allocation table, uh, that one can be uh, fairly easily circumvented if you are if you're creating the Word document or the Excel document and you're aware of file allocation table and you're able to understand how to get that to fragment, um, you can circumvent that one. The middle one uh, is less likely. Uh, and then the beginning of file uh, is very unlikely to be circumvented because the Word, the, the Excel 4.0 macros won't work without that record. So Excel won't know to run the macros without that. So to remove that record or to modify it so that it doesn't have that particular byte that indicates Excel 4.0, that would actually disable the macros themselves. Oh, so if that's a zero? If that's a zero, then the macros won't run at all. The, right. the macros yeah, it won't even know. Yeah, it, it, yeah. yeah it, it'll actually, I, I, I I need to double check, but I think it may even say that it's corrupted. Uh, but, but why is that then not enough on its own to? Uh, maybe I, I missed something. But like, I, if you know that the macros are, if it's a one, isn't that enough to? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just showing you. Uh, this is like the exhaustive uh, list of the okay. places where you can see uh, Excel 4.0 macros. Oh, okay. I think we're out of time, so cool. any questions, you can yeah, probably you find can them come, along the way. Come grab me in the back. and uh, Thank you all. Oh, and one more thing. So tomorrow and Saturday, sorry, tomorrow is Saturday. Tomorrow and Sunday, uh, I'm doing a absolute beginner's malware analysis workshop. Uh, so sign up for it in the front. Um, there was some confusion. It's the same material both days, okay? So no need to sign up for both days. <laughs>